The Bad Seed by Jory John Illustrated by Pete Oswald I'm a bad seed A bad seed Oh yeah, it's true. The other seeds, they look at me and they say, That seed is so bad! When they think I'm not listening, they mumble, There goes a bad seed. But I can hear them. I have good hearing for a seed. How bad am I? You really want to know? Well, I never put things back where they belong. I'm late to everything. I tell long jokes with no punchlines. I never wash my hands or my feet. I lie about pointless stuff. And I cut in line every time. I stare at everybody. I glare at everybody. I finish everybody's sentences. And I never listen. And I do lots of other bad things too. You know why? Because I'm a bad seed. A bad seed. I just can't help it. Sure, I wasn't always this bad. I was born a humble seed on a simple sunflower in an unremarkable field. I had a big family. Seeds everywhere. We found ways of having fun. <laughs> we were close. But then the petals dropped. And our flower drooped. It's kind of a blur. I remember a bag. Everything went dark. And then, then, a giant! I thought I was a goner. I thought I was done for. I screamed and hollered, ah! But I was spit out at the last possible second. I flew through the air and I landed under the bleachers with a huge thud. When I woke up, it was dark outside. A wad of gum had softened my fall. I felt okay, but something had changed in me. I'd become a different seed entirely. I'd become a bad seed. A bad seed. That's right. I stopped smiling. I kept to myself. I drifted. I was friend to nobody and bad to everybody. I was lost on purpose. I lived inside a soda can. I didn't care. And it suited me. Until recently, I've made a big decision. I've decided I don't want to be a bad seed anymore. I'm ready to be happy. It's hard to be good when you're so used to being bad. But I'm trying. I'm taking it one day at a time. Sure, I still forget to listen. And I still show up late. And I still talk during movies. And I do all kinds of other bad stuff. But I also say thank you. And I say please. And I smile. And I hold doors open for people. Not always, but sometimes. And even though I still feel bad, sometimes I also feel kind of good. It's sort of a mix. All I can do is keep trying and keep thinking. Maybe I'm not such a bad seed after all. Hey, look, there goes that bad seed. Actually, he's not all that bad anymore. I heard that. The end.
The Good Egg by Jory John Illustrated by Pete Oswald Oh, hello. I was just rescuing this cat. You know why? Because I'm a good egg. A very good egg. It's true. I do all kinds of good things. Like, I'll carry your groceries. I'll water your plants. I'll change your tires. I'll paint your house. And if you need any help whatsoever, I'm your egg. I've always been a good egg. It's been this way since the start, even in my earliest days, back at the store. There were a dozen of us living together under one recycled roof. There was Meg and Peg and Greg and Clegg and Shell and Shelly and Sheldon and Shelby and Egbert and Frank and other Frank. The other 11 eggs weren't on their best behavior. They weren't exactly good. They ignored their bedtime. They only ate sugary cereal. They threw tantrums. They cried for no reason. And they broke their stuff on purpose. Meanwhile, I tried to take charge. I tried to fix their bad behavior. I tried to keep the peace because I was a good egg. A very good egg. Nobody seemed to care, though. Every night, I was exhausted. My head felt scrambled. Then one fateful morning, I noticed some cracks in my shell. Yikes! They were everywhere. My doctor said it was from all the pressure I was putting on myself. The pressure of making sure everybody was as good as me? I was cracking up, literally. Something had to change. I'd had enough. I told Meg and Peg and Greg and Clegg and Shell and Shelly and Sheldon and Shelby and Egbert and Frank and other Frank that I was leaving. I can't be the only good egg in a bad carton, I said. Blah, 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 they replied. I left that night. I wandered from town to town. The hours became days. The days became weeks. I lost track of time. I was alone. Out there, on the road, under the stars, I really tried to focus on myself and what I needed. I took walks. I read books. I floated in the river. I wrote in my journal. I found simple moments to be quiet. I breathed in, I breathed out, I even started painting. For once, I found time for me. And guess what? Little by little, the cracks in my shell started to heal. My head no longer felt scrambled. I started to feel like myself again. So I've made a big decision. I'm returning to my old carton and my friends. Besides, I'm kind of lonely out here. This time, I know what I need to do. I'll try not to worry so much. I'll be good to my fellow eggs while also being good to myself. Here we go. Everybody missed me. Welcome home. I miss them too. Hello, Meg. Howdy, Peg. Hey, Greg. Greetings, Clegg. What's up, Shell? Aloha, Shelly. Hey, oh, Sheldon. Hi, Shelby. Good day, Egbert. What's happening, Frank? Howdy do, other Frank. Sure, every once in a while, somebody's still a little bit bad, but it's not like before. Here's what I realized the other eggs aren't perfect, and I don't have to be either. I'm okay with that. 
Yep, the old curtain is back together. We're a solid dozen again. It's good to be home. The end. The Cool Bean Written by Jory John and illustrated by Pete Oswald Watch out! Here come the cool beans! The cool beans! Oh yeah! Check out how they move! Look at the way they swagger! Notice their sunglasses? Yo! The cool beans are known all over school. From house to house, across town, beyond county lines. In the olden days, last year, we were all one big pot of beans. We were a mixed bag, but somehow it worked. Yep, those were the good old days. And then we stopped seeing each other as much. That's just how it is sometimes. You spend less time together even though you're not totally sure why. I watched as the beans I knew so well, the beans from my own pod became the cool beans. Oh, they were so cool. One of them could play the guitar. Cool. One of them could draw the best superheroes. Cool. One of them could jump higher than any bean I'd ever known. Cool! Me? Well, I mostly stayed the same. Sure, I made some small changes. I wore sunglasses. Too big. I slicked my hair back. Too slick. I strutted around. Ow! I swaggered. Shit! Oof! I was still picked last for everything. My clothes never seemed to fit. I snorted when I laughed. Honk! I walked into stuff. Whoop! I was an uncool bean for sure. I started thinking of myself as just a common bean with no special skills. I couldn't compete, so I didn't even try. I'd never be a cool bean. It seemed like there were two types of beans in the world. There were the cool beans and the beans like me. Laguma Beach. The days all blended together. I lived my life and things were just okay. I took tests and ate lunches and mostly kept to myself. The cool beans continued being cool. I mean, sure, I missed them. A bit. But it's not like I was going to say anything. I felt like all that coolness had gotten in the way of our friendship. And that's how it went until one day. I was in the cafeteria. I dropped my lunch on my loafers. Oh no, not again. But then, something sort of miraculous happened. Out of nowhere, one of the cool beans helped me clean it up. He didn't even say anything. He just gave me a nod. That was it. Later, I was out on the playground. I tripped and scraped my knee and maybe cried a little bit and, and everybody saw it. Another one of the cool beans came to my side. And without a word, he dusted me off. That afternoon, I was sitting in class. I wasn't really paying attention. Mr. Bean's English. I didn't notice, but our teacher had called on me. Everybody stared. I sat there in silence. Nobody said anything. And then, then, everybody just laughed at me. That was it. After today, I was officially a has-been. But then, one of the cool beans stood up and came over to me. Everybody watched. She leaned in close and whispered, Hey, 
The teacher asked you to read from page 32. Then she gave me a quick wink and went back to her seat. It was a small gesture, sure, but it was also everything. The Great Gatsby. I walked home with a goofy smile on my face. I smiled all the way through dinner. That day made all the difference. It was a day that could have been really bad if not for the kindness of a few cool beans. It gave me a shred of confidence. That shred of confidence has continued to grow. Somebody had my back. Or a few somebodies. After that, I started hanging out with the cool beans again. How have you been? Get it? How have you been? Not all the time, but sometimes. At lunch, after school, even on the weekends. Throughout all of this, I realized that it's not about how you look or any of that other silly stuff. It's about a wink or a nod or a smile at just the right moment. It's about dusting somebody off helping them up again, and pointing them in the right direction. You need a hand? Yes, please. Now that's cool. The end. The Couch Potato, written by Jory John and illustrated by Pete Oswald. I am a potato. Not a small potato like my brother. Not a sweet potato like my mother. Not a mashed potato like my Uncle Stu. I am a couch potato. Oh yeah, it's true. My favorite place to slouch is on the couch. I spent all my free time sitting in this exact spot. Ah! Why would I ever leave this comfy, cozy couch? It's got everything a potato could need. See, I have this, and this, and this, and one of these, and those, and this, and that, and these. Oh, and this. Check it out. This button activates a gadget that fetches me snacks whenever I want. Bam, impressed? And I don't have to move an inch. Much easier than going to the kitchen. If the most important thing in life is to be comfortable at all times, then I think I've got it all figured out. Ah, but wait, there's more. I haven't revealed the absolute best part about my whole setup. It's everything you see in front of me. Have a look around, take it all in. Pretty spectacular, right? Yes, it's a sea of shimmering screens from wall to shining wall. What joy, what bliss! These screens feature my favorite shows. Mad Yam, Fries, Mashed Potatoes. This screen has all my unanswered messages. Blah, 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 blah. These screens are where I play video games. And this screen is a live stream of my friend, my best bud for life. This is how my pals and I spend quality time together. It's much easier than trying to meet up somewhere like folks did in the old days, that's for sure. Hey, Spuddy. Hey, pal Tato. Yes, from this couch, I can control everything in my life all the time with just a few taps and a couple clicks. Not bad, eh? Ah. Yes, sirree, this is the life. At least that's what I thought. Until the other day. 
something strange happened. There was a knock at the door. It was a delivery. Whoosh. It was my newest device, a video camera that would allow me to watch myself react while I was watching all my favorite shows. Woohoo! All I had to do was plug it in and my room, nay, my kingdom would be complete. But suddenly, everything went dark. Look out, coming through. Whoops, Ugh. ow, whoop. I made it to the window. I pulled back the curtains. The sun seemed brighter than I remembered. There was nothing better to do, so I decided to take my dog Tater for a walk. Outside. It had been a while. Everything was so vivid, like a high resolution 156 inch curved screen, but even more realistic. Something smelled fresh. After a few moments, I realized that it was the air. I heard a noise, some chirps, a ringtone perhaps, but no, I looked up to see some birds. I wandered down the street from block to block and across the neighborhood. Eventually, I found a park with a hill. There was a massive tree on top. It looked like a desktop background, only it was real? Neat. I leaned against the tree it wasn't as comfortable as my couch, not even close, but after a while, it wasn't so bad. <sighs> Any worries about the power outage and what I might be missing drifted away. I wasn't thinking about my favorite shows or my unanswered messages or anything else, really. I noticed the stillness, the view, the sky, the clouds, the sunset, and those colors. My goodness. It took a while because there was no fast forward option, but eventually the sun sank below the horizon. By the time I got home, the power was back on. I sat on the couch. Whew. I hit the button to brush my teeth. Scritch, scritch, scritch. I pulled the lever to change into my pajamas. Bloop. I turned the knob to watch a bedtime story. Good night, Spud. Then I noticed my reflection in one of the screens. I wondered how much of my life had been spent in that very spot. It was then and there that I made the decision to peel myself off the couch a bit more often. Maybe every day even? And so that's what I've done. I've started hanging out with my friends, my best buddies outside. We've started biking and hiking and swimming and hiding and seeking. Sometimes we have snacks and play board games. Sometimes we talk all day. We might watch the clouds. There's no big plan. We just see what happens. It makes me wonder what if I don't always need to be totally comfortable? What if I'm happier when I have a better balance between my gadgets and the world outside? Because it turns out that I'm more than just a couch potato. I'm an amusing potato. I'm a smart potato. I'm a kind potato. I'm an entertaining potato. And I must sit on a hill and watch the sunset potato. Yes, there's a great big world out there and I want to be a part of it in person. But don't get me wrong, at the end of a long day, after I've run and played and talked and laughed with my friends, I still think it's awfully nice to slouch on the couch. The catcher in the fry. <sighs> The end.
The Smart Cookie by Jory John, illustrated by Pete Oswald. Greetings, I'm a cookie. I live in a bakery on a street corner near a river. Come on in. Welcome to our little community. It's a warm and supportive place to spend some time. Pretty fantastic, eh? These days, life is sweet. But my journey wasn't always a cakewalk. When I was younger, I couldn't have imagined fitting in here. For a long time, I didn't feel comfortable speaking up or sharing my ideas. I didn't feel like a smart cookie. I wanted to be a cookie who knew all the answers. A cookie who felt confident in a group. A cookie who said, aha, when solving a puzzle. Like this, aha. Looking back, I had some trouble in my early days. I went to school in a gingerbread house. Our teacher, Miss Biscotti, was kind and patient. When I arrived each morning, she'd wave at me and smile but I didn't get the best grades. And I never raised my hand because I couldn't think of the answers as fast as the others. And I was the last to finish most tests. It wasn't because I didn't care and it wasn't because I didn't try. Sometimes I'd get distracted and mess up even though I knew the material. Those were the most frustrating moments of all. Once. I misspelled the word dough. That was rough. Another time, I added when I meant to subtract. Occasionally, we'd have a lesson where I had absolutely no idea what was happening. I just couldn't keep up. I imagined that my desk was a raft and that I was completely lost at sea because that's what it felt like. At night, I slept in a cookie jar. I had about six dozen roommates. Move! You move. No, you move. No, you move. No, you move. I'd stay awake and stare out the window and worry. And it went this way day after day after day. But then something happened that changed everything. It all started with a homework assignment. Miss Biscotti requested our attention one afternoon. Tonight, I would like you to create something completely original, she announced. It can be anything you want. Please bring it to class tomorrow. That was it. There were no further instructions. Miss Biscotti winked at me as I gathered my belongings. I felt like I had a million butterflies in my stomach. Create anything? Something original? Do tomorrow. Loop. When I got home, I immediately went to work. At first, I tried a cooking project. The results were half-baked. Next, I tried to hammer and nail something. It splintered immediately. Then I tried making a sculpture. It was a complete bust. I wondered if I was about to fail yet another assignment. I was stuck. I stared out the window and watched the rain hit the river. There was something mesmerizing about the water, how it moved in such a chaotic way, swirling around and around, yet ultimately figuring out exactly where it needed to go. Suddenly, I had an idea. I decided to write something original, a poem. Aha! I came up with a title based on how I'd been feeling, my crummy days. After that, the rest of it seemed to fall into place. I wrote and I wrote. I lost track of time. An hour went by in a flash. Aha, I said when I was finished. I couldn't sleep that night, but it wasn't because I was worried. It was because I was excited. I felt like I had really accomplished something. I felt smart. The following day, 
Miss Biscotti asked for volunteers to share what we'd created. One kid showed off his original frosting art. Another kid revealed her sprinkle distribution machine. It was neat seeing how everyone was good at such different things. Finally, Miss Biscotti turned to me. Would you like to share anything, she asked. Loop, I gulped. I thought I'd probably crumble under the pressure. But I made my way to the front of the classroom. I noticed my hands were shaking. My mouth went dry. This poem is called My Crummy Days, I said, my voice cracking. Then I read it aloud. As I spoke, I noticed some kids nodding at certain lines. Other kids laughed at parts that were supposed to be funny. As I built toward the finale, I felt myself becoming more confident and animated. And in the end, everybody clapped and cheered. I promise you this, I'll never, ever forget it. Miss Biscotti was beaming. No one but you could have written that poem, she said. It was completely original. Aha! I had done it! I'd created something and shared it with the world. Well, my world at least. The rest of the day was a blur. By recess, I was already planning my next poem. I would call it My Sweet Morning. Aha! I thought when I came up with the title. Later that afternoon, Miss Biscotti handed me a note. It said that I should keep on writing, no matter what. That meant so much to me. School was a bit different after that. I wasn't so scared to raise my hand or ask a question or share my work. Sure, some things still don't come as easily for me as they do for others. But now I know that you can be smart in many different ways. You don't have to have the answers to every question or suddenly be great at everything all at once. You just need a chance to try all kinds of things to find out who you are and what you like to do. As for me, I learned that I can write and I can think of great ideas. And I found plenty of other things I'm good at too. I no longer feel lost at sea. It's more like floating down a river. And the best part is, there's always more to learn. Because we're all smart, cookies. The end. The Sour Grape Written by Jory John and illustrated by Pete Oswald. I'm a grape. A sour grape. Grrr. If somebody upsets me, I'll remember it. If somebody wrongs me, I won't forget it. If somebody insults me, I'll never ignore it. Nope. See that banana over there? That banana slipped and bumped into me, so I'm holding a grudge. See that orange? That orange didn't call me back for a week. Grudge! See that lime? That lime borrowed my scarf and never returned it. Grudge! I suppose I've got pretty thin skin for a grape. Nobody steps on this grape. Grrr! Granted, it wasn't always this way. I grew up in a close-knit bunch. There were about 3,000 of us in our little community. We were sweet to each other. You look nice today. So do you. Now you do. We all lived on a vine. Sure, it was a bit claustrophobic, especially when we were trying to get ready in the morning. Are you done in there? Come on. But my family was ripe with humor, goodwill, and warmth. We did our best with what we had. Are you going to finish that? My grandparents visited on the weekends. We'd stroll in the sun and they'd teach us what they knew. They said that it takes a bunch to raise a seed. 
They said that good grapes roll their own way in life. They told us to be kind, forgiving, considerate, and grateful. Are grateful, my grandpa said with a wink. Above all, no matter what life throws at you, and there will be a lot, try to stay sweet, my grandma said. Indeed, we said in response. And for a while, I was the sweetest of the sweet. I said please, I said thank you, I brushed aside life's little annoyances. I knew how good I had it. Oops! <laughs> no problem at all. But then one day, something changed in me. It was my birthday. I had rigorously and vigorously planned a big party for weeks. I'd sent out invitations with the date prominently displayed. Get this! I had a ferris wheel, a magician, and hay rides. I had snacks upon snacks upon snacks. The highlight of the party, though, was a fireworks display which would happen at sundown. I stood out front and waited for folks to arrive. I had a gigantic smile on my face. I waited. Everybody was a little late, it seemed. No big deal. No big whoop. So I waited. A tumbleweed rolled by. A coyote howled in the distance. Ow! The sun sank behind the hills. And I waited. Nobody showed up. And I mean nobody. By the time the fireworks show started, with me as the sole spectator, I was scowling. I considered everybody I'd invited and only one thought came to mind. Grudge, 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 grudge. After that, my personality became something else entirely. I went from a sweet grape to a bitter grape to a snappy grape. Who moved my chair? Finally, I became a sour grape. Grrr. I started holding minor grudges that eventually became major grudges. Why don't you watch where you're going? I scowled so much that my face got all squishy. You know what? Don't even bother calling me back. I took my grumpiness out on others. Are you ever going to return my scarf? And that's just how it's been. Day after day, week after week, month after month, grudge after grudge. But something happened recently that changed my thinking. I was getting ready to meet up with my friend Lenny, the only fellow I know who's as sour as I am. Lenny and I usually go to the park, where we sit on a bench and rant about stuff. But just as I was heading out the door, I bumped my knee. Oof. After I bandaged myself up, I discovered I had a flat tire. Ah! Then I missed the bus, and the next bus was late. Wah! Finally, I got off at the wrong stop. Sheesh! By the time I arrived at the park, it was getting dark. Lenny was fuming and furious with a frown and a furrowed forehead. His face looked all squishy. We agreed to meet at exactly four o'clock. You're three hours late. I tried to explain why I was so tardy, but Lenny wouldn't listen. He'd already made up his mind. He'd formed a huge grudge and he wouldn't budge. I couldn't believe it. How unfair, I thought. How ridiculous, I thought. How, um, how similar to the way I would react. Hmm. Lenny was pretty worked up. He was pacing back and forth, emitting occasional grumbles. His tone was tart. So I gave him a little space. Besides, it was nice out. 
I notice the sky changing colors, the melodic chirping of the birds, the evening breeze, the buzz of the park's insects coming alive at night. I suddenly felt grateful and peaceful and calm. Had I been missing all this simple beauty because I was too busy complaining? Meanwhile, old Lenny stormed off muttering something about disrespect and lack of consideration. I'm pretty sure I heard him add in a grrr too. I walked home. I pulled a dusty box out from under my bed. There were old family photos inside. I spotted myself in one of the pictures. I was so sweet. I knew that little grape from the photo was still a big part of me deep down. It would just take some work to get back there again. And that was the exact moment I found the invitation I had sent out for my infamous birthday party. The one where nobody showed up? It said May 31st, but wait! Wait a minute here, my birthday was on May 21st. Alas, I told everyone to come on the wrong day. Oop. It was all my fault. I realized nobody's perfect, not even me. After that day, I started noticing other things too. Like how remaining sour all the time is so draining. I'd wasted so much energy holding grudges when I could have easily cleared the air if I'd felt hurt. And yes, I still get upset from time to time, but that's okay. Because now I talk and I listen and I work things out instead of just walking away. My sourness is fading. I'm letting go of all my grudges. And hey, it's working. Slip ups happen. I'm just glad you're okay. Oh, thanks. That scarf looks sublime on you. Why don't you keep it? Really? You're the best. Orange, you glad we got to catch up? I'm so grateful that we did. Sure, sometimes I still let out a little grrr when I'm frustrated, like this. Grrr. But then I move on. My face is less squishy, too. Oh, and don't worry. Things are okay with Lenny again. Gosh, I'm sorry I'm late. You must be furious. No big deal, my friend. You know what? If you look at things in the right sort of way, and if you remember to be kind, considerate, forgiving, and grateful, life really can be pretty sweet. Yes, indeed. The end.